Hi guys, welcome back to Responsive Web Design for Beginners, a Tuts Plus Premium course. My name is Ian Yates, and this video is going to take the form of a quick history lesson, just to give you a solid basis which we can work from. So, you're interested in responsive web design. That's great. You've heard about it, you've most likely by now experienced it in one form or another, and now you want to learn about it in order to implement it yourself. But firstly, what do we mean by responsive? Just to make sure we're on the same page here. A responsive web page alters to the viewport, the visible screen area, of the device it's being viewed with. The layout grows and shrinks fluidly, as do the images within the layout. Also, the layout changes. It rearranges in order to optimize the user's experience depending on the screen size. Where a desktop page layout may cover a number of columns and areas for a wide screen experience, its mobile counterpart might display everything in one neat column, visually recognizable as the same design, but in a different form. Now the term responsive web design first came about a couple of years ago, so it's still very much in its infancy. And as with all infants, there's a great deal still to be learned. To really understand what responsive web design is, we first need to take a step back in time and think about why we found ourselves in this place. Now design has been around for a long time, whether we're talking about newspaper layouts, ancient Roman posters, or even cave paintings, Graphic design of all forms has always had one thing in common, and that is constraints. The printed page has boundaries. Newspaper pages, posters, even cave walls, if we're going to continue that metaphor, have limited physical dimensions. So it's only natural that we designers have become used to designing within very fixed parameters. If I'm designing a printed business card, I know how wide it will be. I know what the optimum text point size will be, and I know how many characters will fit into the space available. Now, print designers have always been renowned for their attention to detail. Typographic detail, precise color reproduction, the use of grids and finely calculated proportions. The transition into web design, therefore, understandably, became a translated version of the print designer's workflow. First, we determine the dimensions of the canvas, and then apply the design to that canvas as precisely as possible. It's logical, really. But designers couldn't say with certainty how big their users' screens were. But for a long time, there was a reasonable safety in assuming the screen resolution would be uh, 1024 pixels wide. That was very, very common. So this gave designers a solid base of 960 pixels to work with, and this would give them a decent figure for calculating grids. It lent a bit of white space either side, and it still left room for the browser application window itself. There were exceptions, of course, but anyone with a larger screen would still be able to see the 960 pixel layout, and anyone with a smaller screen, well, they should just buy a bigger screen. But this precision, this inflexibility, created more problems than it solved. In trying to control our designs down to the last pixel, we completely missed the point of the web. The rise of internet-enabled devices has caused us to take another look, however. Only since the internet has become more commonly consumed on many different screens and machines have we truly realized the consequences of building rigid and inflexible websites. The irony is that the web is in fact inherently responsive, if you build a web page using common, standards-based HTML markup, browsers of all kinds will treat the content as fluid, allowing it to respond to the viewport width. Before a designer has ruined the page with static dimensions and inflexible constraints, it's actually perfectly fine. That's not to say nobody realized that things should be different. As far back as 1997, that's 16 years ago, Adobe's Jeffrey Vane, who was then part of Wired magazine, wrote Hot Wired Style, a book about smart decision making when building websites. He said, the web's content must be built to travel across vast networks to unknown devices and browsers. So you see, even then, he recognized that our content would be heading towards unknown devices. And the same is still true. 
Just because the mobile market appears to be saturated with millions of smartphones and platforms, I can guarantee you that in five years' time, the browsing landscape will look very different from its current incarnation. Another resource which every web designer should read is John Alsop's Deo of Web Design from April 2000. Again, a long time ago. And this is a philosophical essay on design, and it's filled with some pretty amazing and insightful quotes, such as, We should make pages which are accessible, regardless of the browser, platform, or screen that your reader chooses or must use to access your pages. Again, John also recognized that we shouldn't be designing within parameters that we can't control. Our designs must be accessible under whatever circumstances they find themselves in. So we've been trying to control our designs, aiming for devices for specific screens, when actually we should be designing to set our content free. The simple fact is that we cannot know exactly how our content is being accessed. We don't know now, and we really don't know about several years down the line. So that kind of lays out where the problems came from. And the solution came in the unlikely form of a tall bloke from Massachusetts, Ethan Marcotte. Now what Ethan did is take existing technologies and techniques, and he combined them to carry out what he eloquently coined responsive web design. Genius. He laid out these ideas and the thoughts behind them in an article on A List Apart. And like the two resources I've already mentioned, it's pretty fundamental reading. He drew inspiration from responsive architecture, of all things, where architects have built living spaces which respond to the people within them. Imagine walls which move and flex, climate which is dependent upon the number of people in a room, lighting which optimises for those people, the list goes on. And he concluded that we can design from optimal viewing experience, but embed standards-based technologies into our designs to make them not only more flexible, but more adaptive to the media that renders them. He set out three important pillars of responsive web design. Three ingredients which, when used, lend responsiveness to your design. And those are fluid grids, flexible images, and media queries. Now we're going to pick each one of these apart during this course, so don't panic if the terms don't really make much sense yet to you. But for now, let me leave you with a day of web design, and you should also check out this interview I did with Ethan Marcotte, which was published on Web Design Tuts. Uh, feel free to read Ethan's A List Apart article too. I'd certainly recommend you do that at some point anyway. Next up in this Responsive Web Design for Beginners course, we're going to take a look at the concept of mobile first. My name is Ian Yates, and from all of us here at Tuts Plus, thanks for watching.